Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our virtual Wellfleet Public Library event of Suzanne McConnell presenting her work with Kurt Vonnegut, Pity the Reader, on Writing with Style. We are so happy to have Suzanne here and to have her book here and to have this wonderful evening with all of you. We welcome you and our only regret is that we cannot open our um, doors to you, but there are always silver linings in these. And um, one of them is that we can gather from all over the country in this virtual space. And as I've been watching Suzanne watch all of these people come to see her event, including the first people that she shared a colony, a, a, a place with out here. It's pretty exciting to see that. And, and um, that would not be possible without this kind of online forum. So I think that, that is, that's pretty nice. I'm going to introduce Suzanne and then I'm going to have her talk about the book. I'm going to ask her a few questions about it and then I'm going to open it up to you all for a few questions. So tonight we are going to be hearing from Suzanne McConnell who has taught at Hunter College for 30 years and serves as fiction editor for the Bellevue Literary Review. Her fiction has won first prize in the 2015 New Ohio Reviews Fiction Contest, first prize in the 2014 Prime Number Magazine Awards for Flash Fiction, second prize in the 2008 So To Speaks Fiction Contest, and has been nominated twice for the Pushcart Prize. She recently completed a novel, Fence of the Earth. She lives in New York and in Wellfleet with her husband, the artist Gary Kuhn. Welcome, Suzanne. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Hello, Dick. <laughs> um, thanks to Jennifer Wirtkin, director of the Wellfleet Library, and to all of you for coming. And now there are so many close friends that I, I don't know how to address this audience. Um, but um, I'm going to start by talking about uh, a little bit about the how I was introduced to the book. Um, I was asked to do this book by Dan Wakefield, uh, who decided at the last minute that he didn't want to do it. Um, and he and the Vonnegut Trust had concocted this idea. But I was told that about 60 to 65% of it had to be Vonnegut's words and that um, the, the aim, the audience aim was for writers, teachers, and kind of everyone else. So when I began writing it, um, you know, that was, that was my audience. And after a little while, I thought, who's, what, where is this voice coming from? It was a different narrative, nonfiction voice than I normally used. I mean, in fiction, I use all kinds of different voices, but I didn't quite recognize this voice and it was coming out pretty easily. And then I realized it was my teaching voice. Um, and the reason the book is such an odd mixture of things is that I wrote it the way I teach, which is throwing whatever is necessary, whatever comes up, whatever is pertinent to the subject um, in. So, you know, it's a part memoir, part biography, part, um, part, writing instruction manual um, and it's all those things so it's a it's a very funny amalgamation um, i'm going to start by the another another i'm going to start by talking about another principle that i used which was kind of a wacky one um, and i will 
read some of it. It's, it's um, originally in my draft, it was actually, um, looking around for my glasses, which I can't find, but it's, oh, they're in my lap. Um, <laughs> um, but it was edited out. Anyhow, it's, um, the principle is, um, well, it's a little story. It's borrowed from a book called Profound P Simplicity by Will Schutz published in 1979, quote, the one book that gives meaning to the human potential movement, according to the cover. The part that has stuck with me for 40 years is his final chapter called Endarkenment. It begins, quote, sometimes my striving towards growth becomes the object of amusement to the part of me that is watching me. He tired occasionally of that striving and rebelled. So he devised a workshop called Endarkenment. In it, the participants were encouraged to be devious, superficial, and to wallow in their self-made misery. They drank hard, smoked like chimneys, stuffed themselves with junk food, and blamed everybody else for their problems, starting with the other workshop members all the way up to Almighty God. In teaching sessions, each person divulged their worst trait and explained how the others could acquire it. One man said he never finished things. He promised he'd teach the group how to do that the following Wednesday. When Wednesday came, he had dropped out of the workshop. So I've adapted the word in darkenment and redefined it to use as a guiding principle. When alternatives, ironies, warnings about, or contradictions to previous advice or ideas pop up, the concept of endarkenment is at work. Originally, the word in bold marked those places, but these intrusions bit the dust in the editing process. I had them throughout the book, but um, it was a little interruptive. This term and methodology, I hope, will trigger the notions that truth, not the same as facts, can be many-sided, and that Vonnegut was a human being, not a dogma god. I really wanted to avoid what happens when someone becomes famous, which is a kind of cultish worshiping thing as we can see on the opposite side of the coin going on in politics. So um, that was part of the reason for that. Um, um, People always want to know how I met Vonnegut, though most of you here that I'm seeing probably already know that. Um, I met him at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, and um, the workshop for him, he told me later, he thought was certainly as important for him as it was for any of us. And I think that's true. He, I have a chapter called Breakthrough, and he did have a huge breakthrough there. He had been trying to write about his experiences as a prisoner of war in Dresden, um, which simplifies it quite a lot, for over 20 years. He, um, in case you don't know this, he was a German-American who was a soldier in World War II, fighting in Germany, arrested after a month, captured by the Germans, put in a slaughterhouse, and then bombed by the Americans. So uh, many sides of enemy and friend, quite confusing, quite contradictory, and um, his sensibility, which may have started before that, certainly was honed by those incredible contradictions. Um, so he had tried to write about this for 25 years. Um, and at Iowa, he actually nailed it. And I have a chapter called Breakthrough, which is about all the confluences of things that came together to to make that happen, which I won't go through. Um, 
But one of them was the community, the community of writers. Um, he had been isolated on Cape Cod and there he was with other writers and some of the ideas that were going around at the time helped him just the sense of it. He also got a contract. There are lots of, lots of elements. For me, Iowa was revolutionary for my life. I had hitchhiked there, actually. Um, I, uh, I had... Um, I had graduated from University of Arkansas with um, one story. I got in on the workshop on my one story. Um, I didn't know anything. And I took my $25 prize money from winning my first, prize, first short story prize at Arkansas on a Greyhound, paid for a Greyhound bus to New York City. That's where you go, right? <clears throat> Lived in a youth hostel, got down to a nickel, couldn't find a publishing job, um, didn't know whether I was at it, applied for the workshop, didn't know if I was accepted by the English department. I was accepted by the uh, writer's workshop, but I didn't know if I was accepted by the English department. And my father was not going to give me money to go to graduate school. He thought it was a, you know, a quirk or something. And um, so I was desperate and a guy was hitching hiking people hitchhiked in those 60s days all the time to uh, Chicago and he was living in my youth hostel and I said can I hitchhike with you and he said yes so we I, we did we had an accident on the way all these things happened and then I had enough money to take the bus from Chicago to Iowa City in the bus line I stood behind a guy who had U of I on his sweatshirt and I said, whose name was Nick Meyer. He eventually was going to be a movie director, but at that point he was just undergraduate Nick Meyer. And I said, I haven't got a place to stay. I don't have a job. I don't know if I'm accepted. Um, do you have any suggestions? And he said, well, you can stay with me or my girlfriend and you can get a room for really cheap at Black's Gaslight Village. And there are a lot of restaurants where you can get jobs. Next day, got a job, got a room found out I was accepted. And then a couple of days later, I walked into the classroom and there was Kurt Vonnegut, who I didn't know from Adam, never heard of him. This lanky guy smoking a cigarette in a, with a cigarette holder, looking completely absurd and funny and struck my funny bone immediately. So, you know, without the workshop, I know I wouldn't have continued writing. I didn't have, I didn't have enough support, enough self-confidence, anything. So, um, you know, everybody had stories like that, a lot of stories like that. So anyway, um, that's what happened at Iowa. He was a wonderful teacher. Um, everybody has different feelings about teachers, but um, I felt like we got the best of him there. He said later that he did his best teaching there. He, um, he wanted to be there. He was uh, so excited to be there. He worked very hard. He, um, he just gave us a lot. And he was a kind of hands-off teacher. He wasn't he wasn't like looking at every word. He was like, go ahead, do whatever you're, do whatever you're doing. <laughs> it's kind of like that. But he was very um, personable. He was, as he was in class, as he is as a writer, kind of very down to earth, very um, uh, respectful and um, funny, but also he could get angry. He, you know, he was, he was a human being more so than any teacher I had before that, I would say. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from a chapter. I'm just going to read a little bit, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, Jennifer's going to ask me questions. But there's a chapter on Black humor that really speaks to what's happening right now that I want to read. Um, so this is chapter 30. Um, 
to find my very marked up book here. Okay. Um, it's got all these things in it. <laughs> um, I'm going to say quote and unquote because it's very mixed between him and me. Quote, laughter or crying is what a human being does when there's nothing else he can do. Me. A scene in Cat's Cradle illustrates it as well as any in Vonnegut's work. The character Philip Castle is telling another about a catastrophic shipwreck off the fictional island of San Lorenzo. It washed a load of people on shore. Quote, this is from Cat's Cradle. At Father's Hospital, we had 1,400 deaths inside of 10 days. Have you ever seen anyone die of bubonic plague? He describes blackened bodies, swollen glands, putrid smells, stacks of dead. Quote, Father worked without sleep for days. Worked not only without sleep, but without saving many lives either. Anyway, one sleepless night, I stayed up with father while he worked. It was all we could do to find a live patient to treat. In bed, in, after bed, after bed, we found dead people. And father started giggling, Castle continued. He couldn't stop. He walked out into the night with his flashlight. He was still giggling. He was making the flashlight beam dance over all the dead people stacked outside. He put his hand on my head. And do you know what that marvelous man said to me? Asked Castle. Nope. Son, my father said to me, someday this will all be yours. Nobody's laughing. I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think we're all kind of stunned by political humor a little bit right now, too. So, um, yes. Um, yeah. It's. Um, yeah. It's all a lot right now. Yeah. Um, he, talks about, he talks about what black humor is. It's like German, Austrian, Polish gallows humor. And I have one more other anecdote he says that's really like gallows humor. This country has made one tremendous contribution to gallows humor, and it took place in Cook County Jail. Kurt reported that Nelson Algren told him this incident. Nelson Algren taught at Iowa as well. A man was strapped into the electric chair and he said to the witnesses, this will certainly teach me a lesson. And Kurt says that the, the time he got the biggest laughs was um, once in an audience um, at Notre Dame at a literary festival, it was a huge auditorium. And he said, all I had to do was cough or clear my throat and the whole place would break up. Martin Luther King had been shot two days before. There was an enormous need to either laugh or cry as the only possible adjustment. Well, um, yeah. That certainly resonates. Yeah. It certainly resonates. I, um, when I was reading this book, and I know we, we, had, we, we had talked about this a little bit, but um, what really struck me um, as central was the chapter on agents of change and writers as agents of change. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if you'd talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So he, I'm going to go to that chapter. So he really did feel that um, writers were agents of change. There's a um, quote. Uh, this was in a Paris Review interview. He says, um, what, in answer to why he writes, he says, my motives are political. I agree with Stalin and Hitler and Mussolini that the writer should serve his society. I deal with dictators as to how writers should serve. Um, but he was very much 
he was, he was, I would not be interested in writing if I didn't feel that what I wrote was an act of good citizenship or an attempt at any rate to be a good, ci good citizen. I was raised to be bug house about the constitution and to be very excited about the United States of America as a utopia. It still seems utterly workable to me and I keep thinking of ways to fix it, to see what the hell went wrong, to see if we can get the thing to really run straight. So he was really bound up with uh, his sense of participation in, in his country and in his world and his community. Hence, a lot of black humor. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but also a, bi a big sense of responsibility as a writer. I want to read one other passage in this little short book that's pretty funny. It's, um, you know, he has his character, Kilgore Trout, who's a kind of um, um, uh, what, what's the word for it? That's, well, I think I say it at the end, so I'll just read it. So this is from Breakfast of Champions, which is one of his funniest books. Kilgore Trout took a leak in the men's room of the New York City movie house. There was a message written in pencil on the tiles by the roller towel. This was it. What is the purpose of life? He can't find it. He can't find a pen or a pencil. So he left the question unanswered. But here is what he would have written if he had found anything to write with. To be the eyes and ears and conscience of the creator of the universe, you fool. This is me. That was the fictional writer of Kilgore Trout's answer, and Kilgore Trout was admittedly Kurt Vonnegut's alter ego. The creator, it seems, doesn't have eyes, ears, or conscience. The creator, another one of Kurt, Kurt's characters says, is the laziest man in town. So it's up to us, in Vonnegut's view, to be that conscience, especially us writers. Yep. Big responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that you also say that writers can um, um, broker change in other ways by, by writing about something or someone, even if dead or disappeared, they can make that person alive. Writers can be redeemers. Yeah. He, he does a lot of redeeming in his work. He redeemed his mentor who, he, he, in anthropology, who had these brilliant ideas, Slotkin, and um, committed suicide. He didn't get published. He perished instead. And he um, uses those ideas in Cat's Cradle, in other books. And he revises stories all the time. He, he, um, you know, he revised, he revised the essential Christian story, Christ on the cross. He told us in class, he tried out jokes for us in class and he tried out this one. And I hope I, I can't probably say it as well as I wrote it. Um, but the moral of the story of Christ on the cross is not, that it's wrong to kill somebody, but just don't kill somebody who's well connected, like the Son of God. The guy next to him was murdered, but he wasn't well connected. He was a thief. So he revised that story. And he has this anecdote in Slaughterhouse Five. You know, we laughed like crazy. We thought, yeah, I'll revise that story. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's incredible incredible view of that right of what that lesson was he revises fairy tales he you know he does a lot of it right um his first his first published story um report on the barn house effect is really about the arms race so he you know right from the get-go he was he was concerned about what was happening to us all. I'm glad he's up in heaven now. 
<laughs> yeah. Although we'd have some fascinating writing, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of Cape Cod in this book. Yes. So um, there is a lot of Cape Cod in this book. And um, here we are. I will read one quote. Um, this is from a this is from a documentary that is not seen very much, um, and I'm making the point when I quote this that uh, it's in the it's on the in the chapter on making a living, and I'm making the point that uh, about struggle. Um, I guess I'll read it because it's such a good point I make. <laughs> If you're a writer, you will probably struggle financially as well, but struggle isn't bad. Struggle means you're engaged, you're learning, striving. What really sucks is listlessness, indifference, purposelessness. Listen to this, the toughest part of Kurt's life economically was also the most productive. So this is the quote. The bulk of my work was written on Cape Cod where I lived from 1950 to 1970 probably was the shank of my creative life. I would have been quite content to have created what I did by 1970 when I finally left Cape Cod. I used to walk on the great salt marshes there and geese would fly up ahead of me and I would come home from a four hour work, four hour work, walk, feeling healthy and happy. So he had six kids, struggled, had all kinds of jobs, no recognition, and it was the shank of his creative life. I think it's really important to remember that. Um, but it's full of Cape Cod because I'm on Cape Cod every summer. And you know, you know, when you write something, uh, when you do anything with a with a focus, the fairy godmother just seems to hand you things. Mm -hmm. So it turns out my neighbor across the pond, Ivan Chermayev, um, wrote a book with him, a children's book. Ivan Chermayev, who died a couple of years ago, was a graphic designer. He, he, um, he was a ma major player in that and somebody introduced them and Chermayev had all these shapes and he gave them to Kurt. I always thought they collaborated like, oh, we'll do this and then we'll do this. No, not at all. Kurt took the shapes, threw them up in the air, moved it all around, created this completely other narrative. And that's what it came out. It's called Sun, Moon, Stars. So I paddle my kayak across the pond and interview him one day. He tells me what I just told you. I had never really had a good conversation with him before. So that's one. And then Marshall Smith, um, who owns the Wellfleet Marketplace, which has a supply of my books right now, um, is has an anecdote in here it's his house it's it's marion saint ange is his girlfriend and i'm in her office right now and he told me an anecdote about his bookstore in cambridge in the 60s when vonnegut came not to the bookstore because he wouldn't come to the bookstore but outside to this huge audience slaughterhouse five had just been published the war protest was going on so, you know, it's, I don't know, here we are, things happen, you just, it's full of Cape Cod, yeah. And I wrote a lot of this on Cape Cod. So that's, that's a really nice, that's a really nice thing. That is, that is, and it really stands out when, when you read it, and I'm sure a lot of people are noticing that as they are reading it. You did mention, and I should have mentioned this at the beginning, that there are copies of this, there are signed copies of this available at um, the Wellfleet Marketplace. So thank you for that um, to the Wellfleet Marketplace. And um, I really appreciate your signing them as well. Um, there's also um, Provincetown Arts Magazine, which has a really wonderful review of your book in there by Jeremy Justice. Um, and he brings up a lot of really interesting 
points. One of the things he says um, is that um, that your book is priceless, um, but that the practical guidelines on writing well are themselves worth the price of admission, even for those of us who do not write fiction and even those who do not write at all. So, I mean, I like to um, pretend that one day I might put some writing out there, but I can, I can honestly say that just as, as a person, as a human being who is interested in literature, this book is amazing. I don't think this has to be a book for somebody who is just interested in how to write or how Vonnegut would write or how to be a better writer or a, um, a biography of Vonnegut. I mean, it is all those things you said at the beginning and it is a collection, but it's, it sort of transcends everything and it's just really good literature also. Mm. It's, it's pretty amazing that way. Pretty nice to have Vonnegut to build on. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a good it's a good starting place. It is a good starting place. I know you said you didn't want to do the cult light worship worship thing of his, but um, um, you had also mentioned um, you know that he's just a man and that there are people that try to kind of pigeonhole him into this sort of tortured artist idea, and that you don't feel like that's um, appropriate necessarily. Well, I had, I had an argument with myself about writing about this or not, and because it was hard um, to tackle this idea um, about the tortured artist, because, you know, Vonnegut was depressed, um, he, he did, he was full of conflict. Who wouldn't be if you'd survived the bombing of Dresden, the suicide or death of your mother, um, raising three extra children that you adopted besides your own three. I mean, mm -hmm. he was, he carried a lot. He was, he was ambitious for this country and ambitious for, for, his, for life and that brings burdens. So, um, but my argument is that, you know, if every creative person was mentally ill or put it the other way around, if every mentally ill person in, in a hospital was a potential Vonnegut, I mean, our hospital, you know what I'm trying to say? It's like, it doesn't equate the, it, it doesn't make sense. It's a, it's an idea. It's a bad idea that to be an artist, you have to be somehow tortured. Um, I, a, a wealthy artist friend of ours just died, Peter Watts. He was right. a painter. He worked all his life. He had cancer the last several years. He was skin and bone. He made gorgeous paintings all last winter. He just died, but he died just after an exhibit. He went home after the exhibit with all the energy he had, and then he died. I mean, being creative and putting whatever your angst and whatever your issues are into work of any kind is an incredibly positive act. It's an act of saving. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's reversing the chicken egg argument, I think, to say that creative people are mentally ill. No, it's the other way around. It's like, it saves you. It doesn't do the other, it's not the other way around. Mm -hmm. so, so I have a long argument in the book with quoting people and quoting him and blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to say about him on Cape Cod is about his wife, Jane, who um, sacrificed along with him and was an incredible force for him. And um, she, in a, a documentary I just saw, 
uh, their daughter Edie says that she, her, her mother and her father raised uh, Slaughterhouse Five. In other words, it was like a child. They raised it together. So I just, I just wanted to put that in there because she was, she was a wonderful woman. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the other thing I think about, about art making, um, which I don't think is different from other kinds of, of work, which is that it does take a village to do whatever it is you do. You, you know, you're not out there, you know, in your little cave by yourself doing it. No. You aren't. Okay. The photos in the book of mine are also from Cape Cod. I have two photos in there of him, and they're from my first visit to Cape Cod, which was to visit him in 1969. I'm, I'm sort of done. Does anybody have No, that's want? where I was going with, um, <laughs> I was wondering if we should perhaps ask um, if anybody out out there have has have um, questions for Suzanne this evening. The easiest way for me to see you because I have two pages is um, if you look at where it says participants um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you click on that, there's a little icon that says raise hand and I can see that and uh, recognize you the easiest. Um, that works best for me. Um, if you're on a device, if you kind of click on the device, you'll see where that is. Um, and if you cannot manage that, I will scroll through and try to find people who um, have uh, raised their hand the old fashioned way as well. Okay, Janet, I have you first. You can unmute yourself. Janet? Yes. yes. <laughs> Suzanne, what a thrill to hear you uh, talk about your work and your work and Vonnegut's work a second time. Bravo again. I'm interested maybe also because so many people from Cummington are wonderful experience and wealthily sharing a place together. The artists are here tonight and probably so many other artists too about the issue of artistic lineage the influence on the influences on Vonnegut as a writer and how Vonnegut influenced your writing, both in your fiction and in this book. Um, that's a good question and an interesting question in terms of him because he, um, oh God, I, can't, I won't be able to find this incredibly, incredible quote from him, but um, he, um, you know, he didn't major in English. He was not terribly well read. Um, so he he decided after I mean, he was very embarrassed about it. There were in, there was very funny incidents. Dick, I don't know if you were in this class or not, but there was a form of fiction class in which somebody made a very erudite comment in which they alluded to Keats and Kurt. He had this long eyelashes standing up there. He's blinked and he said, who's Keats? And there was a hush and everybody looked around. And then, and then, and then somebody said, you know, Keats, the poet? And Kurt threw the book down and dashed out of the room. And we all roared with laughter. And then he, and then he came back in. After that, he said, I thought it was a student. <laughs> That was some student. <laughs> so he was, he was, um, you know, his wife was the one who had gotten the, the um, good degree in English literature. He was majoring in anthropology and um, was, he, he did a lot of writing as a reporter. You know, he flunked out of chemistry because he was working on the, the, um, the newspaper at Cornell and was in the wrong, he was in the wrong, he was in chemistry because his father wanted to be in chemistry and his brother. 
but all to say is that he, um, there was some, there's some, God, I wish I could find it, some incredible quote in which he says that he doesn't, well, I won't, I won't try to paraphrase it, it's too good, but he, he, he eventually got this theory, or somebody said to him um, that they thought there were two kinds of artists of all kinds, those who are, are um, referring to the work ahead of them and playing off that and very aware of it, and those who respond to life. And he said he was in the second category. He was not in, you know, and he also has wonderful statements, and I think this is true about um, the difficulty of writing well, of writing, not writing well, the difficulty of writing if you've studied all the greatest people in the history of English literature, because it's intimidating if you're trying to match them. He was just trying to get out what he had to get out. So that's that's that. And how he influenced me, um, he influenced me a lot, but it wasn't about how I wrote. It was about, um, well, I have, a, I have a wonderful passage. I don't know if you want to hear it. I've read it before, but it is, it is, it is terrific. So I guess I'll read it. Um, because it's a good question. Um, Kurt Vonnegut taught me about so much more than writing. At a time when I sort of needed models to know that one could keep on trucking, one could even thrive in spite of personal and societal traumas. He was there, a template, teaching and writing. What he taught was more important than writing. He led us to abhor war, to be compassionate toward our characters, to respect people, to question rigid constructs, to care deeply, to try to be decent, to laugh, to tell useful lies. He taught these things by his responses to people's stories, by his anecdotes, by his quiet remarks, by his treatment of us, by being himself. Um, I, won't, I won't read the last paragraph, but it's, it's comparing, well, um, Vonnegut was like a singular sustaining note to me. And it, and it wasn't about writing per se. It was about what's the point of writing? What are you writing about? What's important? That's what he taught. Thank you. Pat, you are next. You can unmute yourself. Um, well, first of all, thank you. And I can't see you. Can are you? No, I. You know, I. I'm not really set up for the visual. Okay. That's okay. And I'm. I'm kind of trying to not cry. Mm. Go ahead. Why not? From what you just said. Oh because it kind of goes to the question I, I wrote down before you read your passage. And the question I wrote down was, what kept you going when you didn't have support? And I, I think you just um, pointed that out. I love what you wrote. Thank you. Thank you. What kept me going was Kurt helped. Uh, I mean, I mean, at a distance, the same way he could help by just being a reader of his work, except that he was a, a person and he did help me very specifically at certain times. But just by knowing by knowing that he was in there working every day, persisting over years, trying to write this damn thing, 
this thing that was tearing him apart and that he saw was much more than him, not just about him, that it was about humanity and that he was struggling that hard and with someone I knew and someone who was my teacher, just, just that knowledge kept me going. Thank you. Just, um, not only for the, the passage that you read, but you know, in your answer just now, um, I, I come from a military family. Uh, one of my uncles was a medic on Normandy Beach. He lost his vocal cord and he, he couldn't speak out. But one of his, um, th the things I loved about him, he always had a smile on his face, always. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. I have um, Jessica up next. Hi, uh, Suzanne. I, I, as you know, I loved your book. Um, I'm so curious. In the intros, you mentioned that you're working on uh, fiction. Or is it done? When does it come out? What, yeah. When little... does it come out? <laughs> yeah. When will you come to me? <laughs> Um, yes, I, you know, when it does come out, I'm going to add to this, tell, tell my story. Um, yeah, I spent more than 25 years working on a book. Um, people here who've known me a long time are nodding. Um, <laughs> it went through, started out 800 pages in its first draft, it was 500 and something pages and it, an agent picked it up, it got sent around, um, he loved it, P mixed reactions from publishers, it's too literary, not literary enough, too slow, too long, blah, blah. So editing it several times, uh, I just now, um, did a very fine tune editing on it, and it's partly a result of writing this book. There's a piece of advice in here that Vonnegut has about writing that really struck me. It was, if a character doesn't react, it's as though nothing happened. And I thought that was so interesting, interesting about life. If you say, I've just been run over by a truck and your partner says nothing. It's as though it hasn't happened. And so that was one thing. And a couple of other things, um, the thing of just a very practical thing, reminding your reader, a novel is such a long thing. When you're writing it, it's so much just to write it. But to remind the reader of certain things at certain times, because as Kurt says over and over and is in my book, reading is a hard thing. People don't, people really don't read very well, you know. I, I mean, if you've taught, you know that. You hand out assignments, then they ask you again and again. What, what was the assignment? When is it due? You know, I, they just... People don't read very well. They don't take information and you have to remind them. You have to tell them in different ways. So I did this kind of very, um, went through the whole thing and just put certain things in. And I am hoping that this book will now be published. It's definitely done, completely done. So I'll let you know, Jessica, thank you. Jessica wrote me from Maine and um, I'm very happy to see you. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled about your book. Thank you. Congrats. Jean, Jean, you're up. Ah, yes, otherwise known as Jeannie Beanie to Suzanne. <laughs> um, so um, this has been so awesome. And my question is, you know, I think one of the great things about writing is that you always learn something and, and it, it can be quite surprising. 
And I, I want to know, in writing this book, what surprised you most? Okay. Well, well I talked about the voice, the, the teaching voice. Um, that sort of surprised me. And, and, and I had more permission in this book. I had something to hang it on. I had Vonnegut. And I also had the promise of publication. Whoa, what a thing. That's just amazing to have that, to know that it's going to be published at the end of the thing. Scott's raising his hand. I mean, most of us go along in the dark. We don't know. And that insecurity is hard to, hard to bear. It's hard to bear that. So, so that was, that's not what I learned, but it's what happened in this book that was different than anything before. And what I, what I learned was I just, I learned more about writing because I was writing about writing. And I also, there's, you know, originally it was divided into sections. The editor took those sections out. So um, I thought they would be easy in terms of teaching. Um, the last section, so there's a section, nuts and the nuts and bolts of writing. There's a section called approaches to writing. Um, there's a section called how to live. Well, how to live, nobody asked me to write about how to live. Um, it's way off the ballpark of, you know, Vonnegut's advice on writing. I, except that you have to live as a writer in and as an artist of any kind in certain ways. And so, and I had all these quotes from him about how to do that, about mental health and about community and about marriage and all that. So, and then I went to an AWP conference once and there was a, there was a seminar, um, something on that topic. And I thought, well, I'm just gonna visit it and see how many people show up. Well. No room, no room on the floor. Everybody wants to know how do you manage the writing life and, and manage to live and keep your spirits up and make a living and have a fan, you know, all that stuff. So I, so I did that section, but I, one had one night, <laughs> this is the last section, one night I woke up and I thought, I don't have to do this, I'm done, I'm done. And I, Two days later, I thought, nah, keep on going. And that's the section that several people have remarked on. And so once again, I don't know what the principle is in here, except the thing of surprise or going beyond what you think, which always happens in writing. I, I don't find it happening as much in nonfiction because you know it's within a parameter. Uh, where you don't have the imagination to use in the same way, but that was surprising and very satisfying. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, hello. Hi. There's Suzanne. Okay. Hi, so Kathy. I, I am so happy to see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I typed up my question and sent it to you in an email, Jennifer, but I'll just try and remember exactly what I wrote. But this is so interesting to me. I, I listened recently to a three-part radio uh, broadcast from Canada, a Canadian broadcast program, three parts on, uh, hosted by Barbara Nickel, who's a writer. And it, the question was about, does reading make you smarter? Or does it make you more intelligent? It was about questioning the assumptions about reading. And it was three part series and it was quite remarkable. And she interviewed, you name it, she interviewed um, Fran Leibowitz and um, Nick Hornsby and Sarah Bakewell and all kinds of other academics and all kinds of people to get various uh, you know, thoughts about our assumptions about reading. And because I think your book is for everyone, you know I think that it's for everyone uh, because it's about humanity. It is about being human and the process of reading and writing and it really is for everybody. But I thought, I wondered about you and, and Kurt Vonnegut, and I thought, well, how would they answer that question? How would Suzanne, how would Kurt ask that? Is, does writing make you, and it is kind of aligned with the question of today, which was in the email about change, you know, does it, so maybe it's, we could look at it from that perspective, like is um, maybe 
that make you smarter might be kind of aligned with does it make you change or can it make you change and because I was surprised by the varying answers from all of the folks that were in the uh, in the program and I just was curious about your response to that um, I have some some great quotes in there about writing literature making people more empathetic because literature is the only art form in which I'm, I'm really speaking about fiction. It's the only art form in which, uh, even though imaginary, the interior of people is inhabited. In other words, you have interior monologues. You have the difference between how a person feels inside and how they act outside. You really can understand a character uh, nothing else nothing else has that seeming avenue to like cut into the gut and the heart of the inside of a person um, poetry does somewhat but it's from the poet so it's it's different than showing them in a context and so there have been there were several articles I read that had showed studies of showing people who were you know, increased empathy afterwards. I don't know how scientific those studies are, but in my own experience of teaching, um, particularly I taught at hospitals for several years. Um, I was not teaching, I was leading seminars at VA hospitals and other hospitals. And we were using literature to encourage people to talk. And, um, I, you know, I, there were certain pieces that I used that people, it really did open them up to being sympathetic. There's that uh, book and film, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, or is it The Butterfly and the Diving Bell? I don't know which way it goes, um, about uh, a, a French guy who was head of L in France, and he had um, severe brain damage and was in what looked like a coma. It was a wonderful movie. Um, and, you know, they were very moved by that. And, and they had had coma, comatose patients, but people in comas look like they don't exist, but they do. And so that, you know, things like that, where they, there were really some shifts or I had, I had assigned a book about, and was uh, written about women vets in the Iraq war and there was a unit on the hospital for women vets, particularly a rape unit. And um, the participants in that session said they really became more sympathetic and empathetic to the, their women patients. So I, I think that, I think it does that. I don't know about intelligence or, I mean, it opens the world. I don't know if it increases your IQ. I mean, you know, it's a funny question. Well, it, um, yeah, well, thank you. I, yeah, it was interesting though. I think that because everybody had such a different response to that, it brought so much, that's why it was three parts, but I love what you were saying and I agree completely about the empathy and, but what was most interesting, I think, was that um, Fran Leibowitz made a very interesting comment where she said that reading and writing is so cognitive and about words, whereas other art forms, say, you know, music or art, almost like mediums, people, you know, and um, true. Yeah. She, said, she said, you know, every artist she ever knew in New York, she'd go to their studio and they'd be playing music and she'd say, how can you possibly work with that music? How can you concentrate? And they say, I'm trying, they'd say, I'm trying to unconcentrate. I'm trying to get out of my head, whereas writers are, and readers are both in their heads. Isn't that interesting? I thought that was such an interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, I live with a visual artist who told me recently that I have different mindset than he does, which I do. I mean, to be visual is to have it right in front of you. And the, the writing process, I mean, it's fascinating to me because sometimes I think I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not using my brain exactly when I'm composing. It's not like my editing brain. It's, it's still like music in a way, only it's language. I see Ian McMillan is on here and I just edited a story of his, a beautiful story. And it's, it's about a guy who can, can hardly speak. And the way Ian renders him is through 
the music of the words and how he experiences the sensual world. But I was really struck by the music of the words. You know, language is, language is a kind of music. So it's, it's not just your intellect that's working when you're composing. It's, I don't know, it's, it's very mysterious. I don't have the answers to it, but I know what you're saying about music and painting because they, they seem to be inarticulate and words seem to be articulate, but there's some way in which you're using these sound words, meaning sound meaning things that are words, um, also like a kind of painting and music not the same, but a little bit. Well, it, it is mysterious, I think. It's a good word for it, yeah. There's definitely a mystery to it. Thank you, that was wonderful. You're welcome, thank you. Um, real quick, someone in the chat who had to leave said, was there ever a time you disagreed with his advice, Vonnegut's advice? <laughs> you have a whole chapter in there vehemently disagreeing with him. Um, it said that um, he has a whole thing about writing to, writing to one person because he, and then I discovered where he, where he came up with that theory. So I came up with a term of my own called method, method, method I don't even know how to pronounce it because I concocted it, methodologism or something I say, and I call it, you know, making up a, making up a ism out of your own experience, which, you know, he discovered after his sister died that he was, he was writing to her, he would say, oh, I bet she would think this was funny, you know? And, but he didn't discover that until after she died. He wasn't consciously thinking, I'm writing this for her. So he has this whole thing about write to an audience of one. In one way, I can kind of agree with him. Like when I was writing this book, I was, I did feel like not, I wasn't writing to one, but I was more conscious of a vague student audience in a way. Um, but I've never written anything and no writer I've ever met has had that adage of write as if you're writing to one person. Um, so I, argue with him about that. Judy Ann, you're next. Hi. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute. Hello. Yes, I, um, I'm Suzanne's sister, so I'm allowed to contradict. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, I mean, that's my role, right? Um, when we were t you were talking about reading and, you know, does reading make you whatever, smarter, aware? And you said, especially fiction. So I have to contradict that and just add that biographies do that. You get into the meat of the person. You get into their why and their wherefore. And it also creates that same empathy, as does reading history, you know, when you look at the depth of who did what, when, and why, and, and so forth, you know. So it's not just literature that opens that passage in our minds and our consciousness. I concede. <laughs> but I do. Thank you, of course You're I'm right. right. You're right about that. She reads a lot of historical fiction and biographies, but you're right about that. Biography does that too. You know, a good obituary does that. Yes. Yeah. A good long obituary. Yeah. Yes. Ian. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Nope. No, no. Start. Oh, Unmute. Yeah, can't. Uh, thanks for talking tonight, Susan. Um, we're just, um, when you were talking earlier about like kind of like the mysteriousness of like the creative process, um, I've been 
just kind of reading lately about different artists' creative processes in terms of like dreams they've been having, like while working on things, especially when it's about like someone who's departed. Uh, so I was just wondering if it's too personal, if it's not too personal, if you've like had any strange dreams or daydreams about Kurt as you were. Oh, I uh, dream about him all the time. Yeah, yeah. great. He was always, um, before I wrote this book, he was always in my dreams as the figure he was in my life. I mean, if I dreamed about him, I knew it was about writing. It was, you know, and, um, you know, I, I still dream about him. I can't remember the last dream I had, but he's, I dream about him a lot. And, and dreams, um, not, not dreams necessarily, but I've, I have always found, but I noticed it maybe more with this book for some reason, that uh, going just, you know, it, it, if you're in a book, you're kind of in it, you're focused on it in a general way, that I would wake up in the middle of the night and have a line from my trying to figure out that puzzle the day before, over and over and over that happened, or have some breakthrough, get up, go, write it down, come back to bed. I mean, the, that liminal time of sleep dream um, and the unconscious working for your focused mind uh, really works when you're, when, you're, when you're really focusing on something. I'm sure it's true in other, not just in art, but in whatever, whatever aspect of life you're working on. You're worrying about your children, you're worrying about your business, whatever. Mm. You know, it's that kind of focus. Yeah. All right, interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? that I didn't get to. Um, yes, Nishama, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, so I was interested in, you know, when you talked about art making as a kind of salvation. I mean, it really is what keeps us going and not just writing. And then I was just sitting here thinking that it, it really gives us access to another dimension. So we can call it the unconscious, but it is, it's beyond that. It's, you know, I'll write a poem, I'll write it, but, and I'll see it months, whatever, later, and I don't know that I had written it. Something happens with the words, something comes through that I would not be able to discover from my usual dimensions in which I live. And I think that's the richness and whether you're a painter or a musician or a writer, you always, you're seeking that access to this other dimension where something happens. It's very mysterious. I think that's what you were saying and Vonnegut was saying huh? to some extent. Yeah. Thank you. Reminder. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. No? Can you hear, can you hear me? Who? Um, Dick Cummins, can you? I, I had yeah. microphone trouble here. Can you? Can okay, you yeah, me? you're a little hard to hear, but we can hear you. Yeah, the mic is on this little external camera. Anyway, um, Susie, I just had a quick question. All this brings back our memories of 1965 and 66 at Iowa. A whole day, I mean, this is like 55 years ago, but memories keep popping up. Uh, Suzanne, do you ever remember on campus seeing someone, a very, a very disfigured per person, blind, uh, that, was, that was called the Moon Man? Everybody said he was the Moon Man. He was in my freshman uh, world history class, and his, he was blind, and he would record uh, his lectures. And he had a completely terribly disfigured head. It was kind of mercatorized. 
um, it just round like a lollipop. It was just horrible. But anyway, the, the point of all that is I was heading in, it was 66, I was heading into a story conference and I got stopped at the Iowa Bridge, Iowa River Bridge. Uh, there was a, a Vietnam protest. So when I got there, I was late and I got there and I said I was late because of the protest. Uh, he asked me what I thought about that. And I said, I didn't know very much about the war, but, uh, and my father was a master sergeant in the army and we went on about that. And I said, by the way, did you see in the paper today that the moon man died? I said, he was in my, in my uh, Western state of class and he had, to, he had to record the lectures on a, on a tape recorder. And I said, you know, I always wondered if he graduated, why, why did somebody put him in there? If he graduated, would he be able to get a job? Would he be able to have a family? Uh, all the things that we took for granted. And then I said something like this. I said, you know, if the government ever wanted to keep people from you know, stopping traffic out on the bridge about this war, all they'd have to do is give them handicaps because they'd be trying so hard to just be normal, that they would never cause any trouble. And his eyes got big and he looked at me and he said, do you read very much science fiction? I said, well, not really. I mean, you know, 20,000 leagues under the sea or something. He says, oh, why? I said, I just, he said, I just, I just wondered. The next class, and I don't remember whether it was in our writing class or if it was in form fiction, he brought in this dog-eared, old, beat-up uh, science fiction magazine, and he read aloud Harrison Bergeron. And that's the story of Diana Moon Glampers, the handicapper general in the United hey. States, who gave everybody handicaps so that they could never criticize the government. A anyway, it, he said that afterwards, the next, the next time we had a story conference, I was talking to him about that, and I, I said, you know, uh, that was a great story. I said, though, the characters are all ideas. And he said, yeah, a lot of my characters are ideas, so I can, I can write about what, I, I can put my words in their mouths about what I'm interested in, which was all kinds of humanity and anti-war and, and everything else. And I looked at him, he said something about, I hope, I hope, uh, you and John Irving and, and you know, John Casey in there, and, uh, Ian McMillan, I hope you guys are all gonna write about ideas. So, you know, cause you, could, you guys could actually change the world. And I thought about that for a minute and I said, I was 21 years old. I wasn't even, I hadn't even graduated from Iowa. I was an Iowa, Iowa English major, corn fed English major there. I just got in because I had a, I got, I got a story back from the New Yorker asked me to revise it and send it back. So they, so they put me into the Iowa Writers Workshop, kind of through a service entrance there. And I looked at Vonnegut and I said, but Kurt, what if we don't have any ideas? And he just said something like, well, write about whatever you want to write about and, and see if it catches on. He says, the market out there for writing is a cage of tigers, Dick. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. And it turned out that that's exactly what it was. Anyway, that's all. I just wondered if you if you had ever remembered Suzanne if I don't remember the moon man or seen him pecking around campus with his with his cane or anything. It was just the saddest thing. Anybody else? Well, Thank you all so much for coming to our virtual Wellfleet Library event. Um, I do hope at some point in the very near future, we can welcome you all and Suzanne with a different book <laughs> to our actual Wellfleet Library meeting room. Um, this has been so wonderful. I don't know if Suzanne, you have any final thoughts you want to share? I, I just want to say um, again, thank you. And the Wellfleet Library in the small town of Wellfleet has always been 
um, the center of social activity and um, the center of the town buzzing. And uh, so, uh, you know, Kurt has several addresses to libraries mm -hmm. and how wonderful they are and how they keep literature alive and how literature is holy to him. So um, it's, it's really what I imagine libraries being in another century and, um, and the value of books. You know, in Germany, they didn't close the bookstores when COVID happened because they considered bookstores an essential business and libraries are essential and Wellfleet Library is really, really incredibly so. So I just wanna thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. Thank you. Please go do get your signed copy from the Wellfleet Marketplace if you are here. It is a fantastic book. Um, and thank you all so much for coming. I hope to see you when we reopen our doors. Good night, everybody.